The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me come and speak today. Boy, this has been a great show, um, our fest. I mean, I, you really, I got I to gotta hand it to the, the folks who put this together. I um, Usually, the, especially for a first-time uh, event like this, it's like, you know, 35 people gathered together in a room. And this has been, the attendance has been great. It's been well organized. Been a couple bumps here and there, but nothing, nothing like you'd normally get with a first-time show. They've done a great job. Um, it said in the printed program that the title of this was SQLite, but I changed the title to, on Monday, to The Great F-Sync Bug. And um, I uh, let Jeremy know about that, and he said, oh, that's too, late. that's too bad because the programs have already been printed. So, but what is The Great F-Sync Bug? This, this, came, this really came to my attention about uh, a little over a year ago when uh, they were trying to get Firefox 3 out the door. And this bug came up that said basically that... Uh, Firefox 3 was calling F-Sync too much, and that was causing it to become very unresponsive. And this was uh, a, a, an important problem because there would be this I.O. storm that would last for two or three minutes, and the whole system, and especially Firefox, would be pretty much unresponsive for that. And they traced the problem to sometimes the F-Sync system call would take over 30 seconds to complete. And this was being called from the UI thread, which was a bad thing. So, um, uh, you know, people were reporting that this bug was, uh, you know, really causing a lot of problems for uh, Ubuntu Hardy and that uh, it was really going to be a PR disaster if they released with this. Now, um, Mozilla is a big customer of mine, uh, and so this, they were, like, leaning on me to help them fix this quickly. So this was, like, we were in big panic mode when this was happening because really the problem was traced where... Firefox was calling SQLite, which is my product, and SQLite was calling F-Sync, was sending that down to the kernel, and, which was telling uh, the Linux kernel to send the data onto the disk surface. And that's what was really causing the underlying problem, that call to F-Sync. Now, lest you think this is entirely restricted to being a problem in SQLite, I, I bring your attention to this uh, issue that came up with KDE, a year later, which is really boils down to the same problem, and I'll come back to that later on in the talk. Uh, but let's start with a little bit of background. What is SQLite? What is F-Sync? Why does SQLite call F-Sync, and why should you care about any of this? Okay, well, what is SQLite? Um, SQLite's an SQL database engine. Uh, well, do we really need another one? Aren't there enough of those already? Well, SQLite is a little bit different from the others. There are like five properties that I like to bring out as distinguishing features which set SQLite apart from everybody else. Uh, we'll start with talking about serverless. SQLite has no server. Most de SQL database engines have a server which runs as a separate process, often on a separate machine. And the clients talk usually via TCP IP, but by other uh, IPC mechanisms to the server, and the server does all the work and does the communications of the disk. With SQLite, it's, it's just a library that links into the client application and enables the clients to talk directly to the disks themselves. There's no server in the middle. Now, there are advantages to being serverless. There are also disadvantages, but since I'm talking about SQLite, I'll ignore those for the moment. Um, if you want to know the disadvantages, there's a, um, um, a fellow manning a Postgres booth up in the exhibit area. I'm sure he can brief you on those. <laughs> Uh, but the, among the advantages is there's no background server process, which means there's no configuration files you have to worry about. There's no inter-process communication that you have to worry about. Uh, since there's no IPC, you don't have to worry about leaving a TCP IP port open on your firewall and allowing uh, the world to be exposed directly to your server. Uh, there's nothing to shut down, reboot, reset, maintain. There's nothing to go wrong. It just, it just works. And we can combine all that together and we call the whole concept zero administration, which happens to be my next distinguishing characteristic. You know, most database engines come with a database administrator. And this person's job is to keep the database running. And there's actually things that you have to do to, to keep the database running. And uh, these are very important people. And if you run a large database installation, you definitely need good administrators. 
but sometimes you don't want an administrator. I mean, that's just not what you're wanting to do. To help give you the concept, let me tell you a little bit about how I originally came to write SQLite. I was working on a project. I was just doing freelance programming. This was in the 90s, and there was this big industrial plant. This is one diagram of 700 and some odd that were describing all the plumbing in this plant, and they were, it was moving around steam and chilled water and oil and all kinds of stuff, pumps, valves, everywhere. And I had to do all this graphic software to, do, to show the state of the, the, the plant. Now, all of this data was coming out of an Informix database. And this was running on an HPUX system, standalone system, that was operated by basically high school graduates. And they would occasionally come around and reboot the server. And when they would do that, about half the time, Informix would come back up and everything worked great, and about half the times, Informix would decide that it didn't want to come back up. And usually, it would decide it did not want to come back up like at 2 in the morning. And when, it, when Informix didn't come up, then they would double-click on the icon to bring up my application, and I would paint a dialog box that looked something like this. And because my application was the one painting the dialog box, I got the maintenance call at 2 in the morning. So that was not good. And the reason, of course, that this was happening was that the Informix server wasn't there, and so the clients couldn't operate. And so my idea was, why don't I just write a new database engine that can go directly to the disk, even if the server's not there? That way, if the computer is healthy enough to bring up my application, I know it's going to be able to get to its database. There's never any question about that. And so that was really what inspired me to write SQLite in the first place. Version 1 came out in 2000. Um, another way to think of SQLite in, in, in relation to other databases is, is by analogy. Here's a picture of a, um, a recording studio, big complex thing. This is where you'd go if you want to make a recording for the next great boy band or something. I mean, you've got lots of knobs and dials, cables. Um, uh, do a, an incredible amount with this, this recording studio, but it also requires a lot of specialized knowledge. Um, this is a personal music listening device. Any six-year-old can operate this. Uh, you know, a client server database is to SQLI as a recording studio is to an iPod, really. Um, I mean, you can do so much more with the studio, but sometimes you just want to listen to a tune, you know? So uh, SQLite isn't really competing with Oracle or Postgres or MySQL. It's competing with FOpen. <laughs> um, the way to think about SQLite is to, it, it's sort of a filter in between your application code and the disk drive which is translating high-level SQL statements into simple read and write requests. That's what we're trying to do. It's not a server. All right, fifth, third of five points, uh, which kind of set SQLite apart, is that it has a portable file format. And I'll come back to this in a minute. I mean, the, a database file in SQLite is just an ordinary file on disk. If, you, if you've got a database in uh, MySQL or, or Postgres or Oracle or whatever, the database is... a uh, a, a, a bunch of files, and they're often some hidden folder someplace that only the administrator has access to, and it's all very mysterious and spooky. Uh, but in, in SQLite, the file is just a single file on disk, and you can stick it on your, your stick or whatever you want. There are no special naming conventions. It's completely cross-platform, uh, cross-operating systems, cross-hardware. It's completely backwards compatible. We're going to keep it backwards compatible. It's not tied to any particular programming language. So it's a really kind of a universal medium for exchanging information. You can take your SQL da SQLite database and move it across different media and read it on different devices. So we combine the ideas of zero administration and portable file format, and we say SQLite makes a great application file format. What do we mean by that? Well, I mean, if you're writing a new application and you, the first thing you do is a file open type thing, and when you do file open, what people normally do is F open the file and then read it in somehow. And it might be XML, it might be common separated values, it might be some binary thing, it might be some home graph. It doesn't really matter. But wouldn't it be much better if instead of reading in this proprietary format and writing all this code to interpret it, just connect to an SQLite database? And then you've got a query language built in, the parse is already built in. When you go to save the file, you get atomic um, updates. You get a fast searching capability built in. You get a, a cool add-on features like um, uh, full text search, archery indexing, and that sort of thing. And you've got all sorts of third-party tools that can access your data. Uh, fourth point, very small footprint. Um, SQLite uh, is less than 300K uh, if you compile optimized for size. If, if you 
give it minus 03, which does lots of loop unrolling and function inlining and you enable all the optional features, we're still less than a megabyte. Um, Oracle client libraries are larger. So the SQLite comes as a single file of ANSI C code. One file. Well, there's a, a second file, which is the header file, which defines the interface, but it's just one file. So if you want to include this into your product, all you have to do is take that one file and drop it down in the middle of your code, and compile it along with the rest of your C, and it goes. Now, it is a big file. It's three and a half megabytes, but it's still just one file. And it doesn't have any dependencies. Um, you don't have to download all of uh, GTK in order to run SQLite. Uh, I mean, it's just some simple uh, utilities that are available uh, on most any development environment, such as you know, MemCopy and Malloc, is all you really need. So you can take SQLite, for example, this, this one file in its header, and drop it into the middle of some much larger project, and shazam, you've got an SQL database built in. It's compiled in. There's nothing to add. There's no dependencies. And finally, SQLite's in the public domain. There's no copyright at all. Um, had some interesting discussions yesterday with, um, uh, uh, with uh, Wendy Setzler about you know, the whole thing. This was probably a mistake going public domain rather than the Apache license, but in 2000, there really wasn't, I didn't have as many options as there are today. Um, but we do have signed copyright releases or signed copyright disclaimers from everybody who's contributed any bit of code to SQLite. And all of those are kept in a fire safe in my office. So it is 100% uh, public domain. Uh, you can use it for whatever you want. There's lots of other features that we could go into, but this is a, this is a talk about F-Sync, not about SQLite, so I'll skip over these really quick. But you can have application-defined functions, and you've got full-text search, R-trees, you can it's UTF-8, UTF-16, either way, so forth and so on. So it turns out that a lot of companies and a lot of projects are using SQLite. For example, uh, Adobe Photoshop uses the Lightroom product in Adobe Photoshop uses SQLite as their application file format. Uh, it's used in um, Adobe Reader somehow. I'm not real sure how, but apparently it is. Uh, a Mozilla Firefox uses SQLite to store just about everything that gets stored. Um, it's in every Nokia cell phone. Uh, it's in the Google Android phone. It's in the iPhone. It's in iPod and iTunes. It's in all kinds of other i stuff. <laughs> it's in the BlackBerry, apparently. It's in the new Palm Web OS. Palm Pre is what they're calling it now. Uh, it's in Skype. Uh, it's in the Sony PlayStation. It's in all kinds of consumer electronic devices. And it's also used a lot in open source. It's, uh, um, it comes included with Python. It's what Yum uses, built into PHP. Subversion requires it now as of version 1.6. It's tracks built on it. It comes with Rails. Monotone requires it. So it's very widely used. Now, I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the, the file format. The SQLite, a, a database, is a single ordinary file on disk. And it's organized as a bunch of pages, uniform size pages. Now, the default size is 1K, but it, it can be something different, a power two. But a, a database consists of a bunch of pages like this. Now, at a lower level, each of these, these pages go together in, to form B trees. And B trees give you a key value pair type mechanism. And the higher levels give you the, the schema layer and all that other stuff. I'm not going to go into the details. You can go and, and, and get a copy of Knuth and read about B-trees all you want. Um, B-trees, of course, just give you an efficient way of, of storing unlimited amounts of data and look it up very quickly uh, in, on external media. It's, it's page-oriented, so it fits nicely into that page-type uh, metaphor that we have. Um, how do we map the B-trees into these individual pages of the tree? Well, it's very simple. Each part of the B-tree gets mapped into one page of the database file. Very simple and straightforward. Um, we won't go into the details here, but it's, it's, you can kind of get the idea of what's going on under the covers there. Um, the other key point about SQLite that comes into play in this discussion is that it's ACID. Uh, ACID is a you know, property of all SQL databases, atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. What people mostly care about there is atomic. Uh, which means that when you make a change to the database, a group of changes that are related, all of them happen together. They all happen at once or appear to happen all at once. You can't get a partial change in the middle. And this, in other words, you've got transactions. And this is true even if you cut the power in the middle of that change, which is an interesting property. 
So if you make a change to the database, it might need to update, say, three pages of the file. And now you need to change all three pages on the disk at the same time. How do you really do that? What if you write the first page and then somebody cuts the power? How does that work really? How do you make this happen atomically? Well, I'm about to explain to you how that works. Um, when you start up, you boot up the machine. This is sort of a diagram showing what's happening inside the computer. On, on, the, on the far right, you've got sort of the information that's on the disk. I'm representing that in blue. That's real information. And then you've got a disk cache in the, in the Linux kernel. It's a cache of stuff because the disk is really very slow. And the only way you're going to get decent performance out of a disk drive is to cache a lot of information in the kernel. And if you look, and if you ever run top and you look, and it, uh, typically at least half of your RAM is, is devoted to cache. So you first boot up, there's nothing in cache. You want to read from the database. You read three pages. You do a read system call, and it pulls three pages off the disk. It also stores them in cache in case you might want to reuse them again later. So it, it first loads the pages into the, the operating system's address space in cache and then moves them over to user space where you can get that to them. And then you say, well, okay, I want to update this, these three pages. I want to perform a transaction. What SQLite does is it does a write system call to write the original unmodified changes in, or unmodified content of those three pages into a rollback journal, a separate file that's in the same directory as the original database file. And then it updates the three pages with the new content. I've shown the updates in sort of a pink color there. But now notice when we did the write system call in the previous step, when the, the information was only copied into RAM in the operating system kernel. It did not actually go to the disk. Well, it might have gone to the disk, but probably not. It was probably just went to cache. The operating system waits and writes things out to disk as it has opportunity, as it's able. Just because you did a write in the write return does not mean the information actually went to the disk. So after we get... At, before we're ready to start committing this, we have to make sure that the information on that rollback journal actually gets out to disk. And that is what the fsync system call does. This forces the content of the file that's, in, that's cached in memory to actually go out and be written onto the oxide of the disk platter. Um, that's the only way to really accomplish that, is to call fsync. Well, you can call fdatasync or sync too, but fsync is what's designed to do that. We have to do that. And then we do a write system call to send our changes out to the disk. And, of course, when you just do write, it only goes to the cache. It doesn't really write it out to the disk. So we have to do another fsync to force those changes out to the disk. And then we do a delete or an unlink on the rollback journal. And this is what actually commits the transaction. And you'll see why in just a second. So after the, the rollback journal has been deleted, the transaction is committed and the changes are safely on disk. Now, why is this atomic? Uh, suppose that... Uh, you were halfway in the middle of this process and you lost power and one of the three pages was completely written out, another one was not written at all, and the third was sort of halfway written. Uh, when you rebooted and the next time somebody tried to open that database file, it would notice that there was a rollback journal sitting there beside it. And it would automatically read all of the content out of the rollback journal and write it back into the database file, just backing out all of the partial changes that had been made. So it makes it look like this is an atomic update. Now, recall that, that first fsync was to get the information uh, in the rollback journal and make sure it got out onto Oxide. What if we omitted that fsync? What would happen then? Well, you could get into a situation there where, you had, where the operating system had started to write information to the disk drive before, that it's, before the original data had gotten out to the disk. So here we've got a situation where... Uh, on, on one, one of the pages in the, in the rollback journal didn't quite get out to the disk before the power was lost, but some of the uh, modified content did get into the original database file. Well, when you go to roll that back, you're going to be rolling back incomplete data, and that's going to put that incomplete data into your database file, thus corrupting it. What about the second if sync? Why do we need that one? Well, in that case, if you were busy writing things out to disk and you lost power, you, it could be that your rollback journal had already been deleted before all the information got to disk. And so there would be no rollback journal there 
to roll the partial rights back and to recover the data. So key points. Uh, the calls to F-Sync are required if the database is going to survive uh, a power loss or an operating system crash. Of course, it's Linux. The operating system never crashes, right? But uh, sometimes, you know, your two-year-old will punch the power button. Um, and the other thing is that F-Sync only writes a few pages to the disk, and it, it, it shouldn't take very much time at all. Well, actually, F-Sync should only write a few pages to the disk and should be very fast. Let's talk a little bit about ext3, uh, which is, I guess, pretty much the, the file system that everybody uses now. Um, I guess my primary development desktop is um, a Zuse uh, 10.1, which is still using Ricer, but other than me, everybody's using ext3, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, and and I would, I'd be using, probably be using ext3 too. It's just, it's just when I buy a new Linux box, I, I call Phil at Computer Gallery and say, send me a new box, and he sends it to me, I take it out, and I plug it in, I use it. I mean, I, I don't spend a lot of time. I used to just, like, build my own and, you know, hand compile my own kernels with just the options that I wanted and all that stuff. But after a while, that gets old, and you just get Phil to do it for you. So, and XT3 journaling works something like what we saw with SQLite, but it's a little bit different. There's a, there's a different twist on it. Suppose you've got some, here I've just got the kernel and the, the disk because applications aren't involved with ext3. Um, you've got three changes and you want to write them to the disk. The way ext3, whoop, went the wrong way, wants to do this is that it first writes the changes to the, uh, the journal, which I've got represented as a small box down at the bottom. And then it writes a commit record into that journal. And that's the point that the, that the change actually commits because ext3 is using a roll forward journal rather than a roll back journal. Went two pages. And so then it writes all of the content out to the disk after it's been committed uh, so that it, it's where it should be. Now, if you lost power at any point there, when the power is restored, what happens is that the roll forward journal is read and the changes are written out to the disk rather than, un so that the changes are rolled forward rather than rolled back. So the other concept that you need to be aware of in order to understand the, the great F sync bug is the difference between metadata and content. Um, uh, metadata is, is your inode information. It's the, 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 the times that are on the file, the, the last modification time, the creation time, the last access time, the file size, the permissions, access permissions on the file, and also the location on the disk where the content of the file is. And of course, the content of the file is, well, the content of the file. Now, there are three journaling modes in ext3. Uh, date equal journal means that all the content and all the metadata is always journaled on every write. Date equals ordered means the metadata is journaled, but the content is not. But the content is, it, it takes care to write the content before it writes, before it commits the metadata. And then data equals write back is, um, it journals the metadata and it just writes the content whenever it feels like it. Now, the default option is, um, data equals ordered. That's probably what everybody here is running on their Linux system is data equals ordered. Does anybody know if you're running something different? What are you running? Are you? And is it because of the F-Sync bug? Oh, okay. Solid state disk. Okay. So anyway, in data equal ordered, the, the writing operation is a little bit different because it's just going to write the metadata out to the rollback journal. And then after it gets the metadata there, before it commits it, it then writes the content directly to the disk. And then, oh, then it writes the commit record. And then it writes the metadata out there. Uh, and so the content is always on the disk by the time the metadata gets there. Now, with data equal write back, uh, well, the content might be there or it might not. And so if you had a crash, when you came back up, your content might be stale. Your content might consist of content that was previously in some other file that was deleted. And that other file that was deleted might have been somebody's private social security number or password, or it might have been the Etsy password file or something like that. So there was a security problem with, with data equal right back. And that's why most people now use um, uh, data equals ordered. Uh, because, and with data equal ordered, because the content always gets to disk before the metadata, and the metadata says where the content is, that means that if once the metadata is committed, the content is going to be correct, which is important. So now let's think about F-Sync. 
under data equals order. Now, what FSync does is it commits the inode, the metadata. And the journal in ext3 is linear. I mean, there's just a single journal. And so when you commit any part of it, you have to commit everything that's been put into the journal so far. And then that means that all pending content changes must be written to the disk before an inode commits. But now if you're going to commit just a one inode and there happen to be you know, 30 or 40 different inode changes in the journal, that means you have to write the content for all of those inodes. Hence, an fsync call in ext3 flushes all changes to the disk from all processes that are running on the machine, not just from your one little process. In other words, fsync is the same as sync with date equal ordered under ext3. So here where we were f-syncing stuff in our, in our SQLite database, and we thought that we were writing just three pages out to disk. If you happen to have another process running in the background, which is doing a lot of disk activity and is writing a lot of things to the disk, unpacking a tarball or something like that, that f-sync that would have, should have just done three pages and quit is actually might be doing hundreds or even thousands of pages syncing it out to disk. Hence, it might take 30 seconds or so. This is the great f-sync bug. Um, how do you work around it? Uh, well, one suggestion is to do F data sync instead of F sync. F data sync just pushes the, the content and doesn't bother with the inode uh, under the theory that um, you know, people won't really care if their M time is out of date. Now, the thing is, F data sync will revert, automatically revert to an F sync if the size of the file has changed. So it's not a 100% not a solution. And also, SQLite is cross-platform. We have to run on lots of different platforms. And on a lot of non-Linux, Unix operating systems, FDataSync is a no-op. I mean, it's there, you can call it, but it doesn't really do anything. And so that's not good. The other thing that, another thing that we considered doing was in SQLite, you, you can do, set a pragma that disables those FSync calls. It just turns them off completely. The trouble with that is, if without doing f-syncs, if you lost power in the middle of a transaction, then uh, that could cause database corruption. We call this the um, live fast and die young approach to um, uh, data integrity. It will cause things to run, it will make things seem to run faster, but uh, it can have bad consequences. Uh, you could change your application so that it commits less often. So, for example, you could modify your application so it does not do a complete transaction every time a person presses a key in the awesome bar. Um, you could limit your commits to when they do a file save. And then if it took a few seconds when the system was busy, people kind of understand that. Uh, or you could, you could keep, run your entire session as a single transaction and use save points instead of using begin and, and, and commit. Um, uh, you could move move your database work out of the main UI thread and put it into a background thread. And Now, in, in recent versions of SQLite, we have an option that you can do this automatically. So if you have a, just a single-threaded program, you can start another thread just to run the database and, and move all the operations over there. Firefox is kind of moving to that, too. Um, the problem with this approach is that threads are evil, and we don't want to encourage them, so I'm not going to recommend this to you. Amen. There you go. <laughs> Question? Uh, yeah, we tried the O direct actually. That slowed it down by about half. Um, you could change your uh, the way you mounted ext3 because if you do date equals write back, then f syncs do what f syncs are supposed to do, just doing their little handle because they don't have to sync all of that extra. Well, it, when you do an f sync with date equals write back, it does have to synchronize all the other inodes that are changing, but that's not normally a problem. It's it's really all the other content that's changed that's the problem. Or you could do date equals journal. Um, uh, I guess that kind of forces things too. But really, making changes to the way you've mounted your operating system is an unreasonable expectation to force upon Firefox users, users, most of whom do not know what a file system is, much less how to change the mount options. Or you could change to using ext4. ext4 has a new feature called um, delayed allocation. So with delayed allocation, uh, the location information that's in the, in the inode uh, is not assigned until you actually write that data. And so with delayed allocation, when you do an F-sync, it's not necessary to, to, to sync all the content to disk because, 
when you sync the inode because the inode doesn't contain the content information. Um, other, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why are we using a, a, an ACID SQL database to store stuff in the first place? Why can't we just write everything into a big file using fopen and close it like we've been doing for the past 40 years? I mean, what's, what, why is the big uh, worry with databases? Well, um, you know, a lot of people do just write a bunch of information into files. Uh, we call this the pile of files approach to database design. And that's worked well, but you know people are are demanding more, and and, and that is in fact what uh, the desktops pretty much do. I mean, uh, you've got a, a .kde file in your home directory and a .gnome file in your home directory, and it's got just tons of configuration things in there. And as you set up your desktop, it's writing to those uh, in, into those folders, lots of little files uh, in various formats, a pile of files database. But as things have become, as as we advance in the art. Uh, people are expecting more robustness. Uh, it used to be that people, you, you, would, you wouldn't think of running a desktop that didn't have a, a UPS attached to it. I mean, that was just unthinkable to, to do such a thing. Certainly a desktop that, that, that had critical information, you would always have a UPS. These days, uh, who, nobody uses a UPS, UPS much anymore, except for in a, a big data center, maybe. Uh, and people are expecting much, people are storing much more critical data on their computers now than they were uh, before it used to be, a, you know, if you lost a file, okay, so you lost your game history, you know. Um, but now people are storing lots of financial information, lots of, of, of critical information there that they have to, to keep. So, uh, using the old pile of files database approach, it really is just another variation on live fast and die young. So, and and this this problem really came up uh, recently here, uh, March 11th. There was a thing on Slashdot about how if you cut the power to KDE at the wrong moment, it will corrupt some of its configuration files. And once the configuration files are corrupt, it will not boot up. And uh, I guess you could you know, go into um, uh, uh, just a single user mode and, and kind of recover things that way if you knew what you were doing. But certainly, um, your grandmother does not know how to do this. And, and even, even a lot of hackers would have, have to spend a couple of hours trying to figure out how to recover from such a situation like this. This was a bad thing. What was happening? With KDE, this this is also a problem with GNOME. Um, they were saving their pile of files data this way. They would open a, a, a new file, and then they would write their content into the new file. Then they would close the new file. And then they would rename the new file on top of the old one. And this was assumed to be atomic, uh, but it was not. Never has been. The way to do this correctly is that you have to call fsync uh, before the rename. If you don't call the fsync, then it could be that the old file is deleted before the new file has been created. And when that happens, you end up with corruption, and, it's, it, and nobody has a good day. Now, the, the, a lot of developers have been leaving out the fsync because of this myth that fsync causes a lot of extra I.O. Truth is, fsync causes no additional I.O. at all. It merely forces all of the I.O. to happen now rather than at some specified point in the future. It's working as a barrier operation to make sure that the things you're, that, they do, that are written before the F-Sync make it to disk before the things that are written after the F-Sync. And the other myth is that, well, hey, it's always worked for me before, right? Why should I change now? Well, in the past, people have been running EXT3, and EXT3 actually flushes everything to disk at five second intervals anyway. And so with things like KDE and GNOME, you had a five second window of vulnerability where you were vulnerable to crashes. But now as people are moving to EXT4, uh, the, the delay in syncing is much larger. This is a performance optimization. It makes things go a lot faster, but you have a much larger window of vulnerability, one to two minutes. So if you, if you cut power within one to two minutes after making a configuration change, you run a, a, a significant risk of, of damaging your configuration files. So I, I don't know if you saw the announcement uh, uh, Wednesday, is it, that there was a new kernel that came out, version 2.6.30. You might have read this announcement. And if you look down on the bullet list of changes, there was one that said um, an implicit internal f-sync of a file after a rename or truncate in ext3 and 4 and in the btrfs file systems 
and this was marketed as uh, performance optimization. What's really happening here is that they hacked the file system code so that if you omit the f-sync that really should be required according to POSIX, uh, it will be inserted for you automatically when you rename. That's all that is. So that's the backstory behind that little bullet that appeared in the release from Wednesday. What can you take away from this talk? Uh, I hope that you've learned that crash robustness is really hard to get right. There's been a lot of people who have really spent a lot of time working on this. If your application is not playing, paying very close attention to crash robustness, it's probably doing it wrong. And there's a tension between crash, crash robustness and speed. A lot of people, they want to cut some corners because it seems to make things go faster most of the time, but on that day when, they, when, the, when you lose power, you could you'd wish you'd, you'd taken the time to do an F-Sync. Don't fear the F-Sync. Um, it, uh, it's gotten a reputation because of ext 3 of being a very expensive system call, but in fact, it's, it, in most cases, it's not, and in the later kernels, it's not. And finally, the, the uh, infrastructure in Unix and all the applications is getting better and better every time. And that is my talk. Do I, are there questions? Up front first. Do I need to back up? No, definitely. <laughs> so now you're telling me all the applications that do the open write S and close are paying a penalty. Correct. The, the, this, new, this, um, this new thing they inserted here, th this does slow down ext4 a little bit. Um, and it's a hack. And it was put in there because it's really too difficult to go back and change all of the applications that are doing it wrong. Yeah. Now what needs to happen, I, and this is just an ongoing debate within the community, but what needs to happen is that, that you know, Linus or somebody needs to say, look, on such and such a date in 2010, we're going to take this hack out. Fix your applications now while you have a chance because it's going away. Now whether or not that actually happens is a big political thing. I, it, it, we may be stuck with this hack forever. I understand that there's a compile time option, maybe it's a runtime option to disable it if you happen to know all of your applications do the right thing, but uh, do you know that really? So I, I don't know. Other questions uh, in the red shirt? Yeah, what did they do to work around in Firefox that up sync issue with the XC3? Uh, you know, I, I asked so many times and I got so many different answers. I'm not real clear on exactly. I, they, what they did is they did a lot less commits. They did many fewer commits. They were doing a complete transaction every time you pressed a key while typing into the URL bar at the top of the browser. And that was, and a, a transaction was actually do, it was doing two or three F-syncs per transaction. And so they changed things around a little bit so they're accumulating and doing much bigger transactions less frequently. And that helped a lot. Um, in later versions, they're, they're doing a lot of their data management in temporary databases. And a temporary database is not going to be around when you reboot, right? So you don't care if you lose power there or if the iOS crashes. And so temporary databases never F-sync. So they're doing a lot of work in those. And then every periodically moving the data out of the temporary uh, databases into the permanent persistent databases every minute or so. And so if you crash, you might lose the last minute or so of your bookmarks, but does anybody really care? And uh, they're doing other things. I, I'm not sure of all the details that they're doing, um, but uh, they've, they've, taken, they've spent a lot of time to, to work around this issue. Notice that it's not really a bug in F-Sync. F-Sync is doing all the right things. It's looking after your data. It's just that it was taking longer to do things because it was being very secure. It was being very cautious. Question. This may be a stupid question. Um, there are no stupid questions. Oh, there are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to me that F-Sync is just the wrong API design for what you need. Would it make more sense for there to be a kernel interface to do atomic transactions? You, you need, well, the right thing to do is to have some sort of barrier operation so that all the writes that occur before the barrier happen before any of the writes that occur after. And then it could delay them for as long as it wanted to. Um, uh, my understanding is that, that, well, first of all, that would not be POSIX. There's nothing like that in POSIX. And, well, right. Has that ever stopped them before? But apparently that was sufficient to stop the kernel people this time. They, they said they've made it pretty clear that there is no barrier operation uh, coming anytime soon in the kernel. So we have to do what we have to do. I've got two minutes in the back with the white hat. 
Yeah, I just want to have a quick comment and a question. Well, sure. I get this a lot, but I just want to again publicly thank you for your efforts on this project and everyone you lead on this. The sequel has made a big positive impact in, in my work and, and people we do. And I, I point this project all the time as an example of things to do right and like, to help win arguments. So, look, well, thank you. My head. Thank you. My head is swelling. I'm not going to be able to get out of the room. Thank you. <laughs> what, what was your question? We have 60 seconds. The question is, is uh, in addition to super light things, sometimes we'll use things like a, a lower level, like a Tokyo cabinet type thing. And I'm just curious, what's your attitude would be to something like that? I mean, well... You know, it, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I try not to tell people what to do. I mean, if you want to use Tokyo Cabinet, that's fine. I I looked at the Tokyo Cabinet code, and I didn't see any F syncs in it anywhere. You don't think it's reliable. I, you know, I just I don't know. I haven't tested it thoroughly, but I looked at the code, and I didn't find any comments anywhere in the code. I didn't find a lot of test cases, <laughs> and it's pretty spare. And um, you know, I'm sure it works great as long as everything's are working. It doesn't have the robustness. SQLite's designed to work on cell phones where if you run out of memory, it handles that gracefully. That never happens on workstations, but on cell phones it happens all the time. You're forever running out of memory. Uh, does Tokyo Cabinet recover gracefully from an out-of-memory error? I don't know. Uh, these are things to, that you might want to ask. Uh, one more question. I still haven't got the 30-second mark, so, yeah. Could you mention briefly about the issues with SQLite on a network file system? I know like an FAQ is always... Right. I have 30 seconds to answer. Well, the basic idea is that S, uh, SQLI is, um, it assumes that the APIs that you call do what they advertise that they will do. And so when I F-sync or, or create a lock on a file, it really is F-syncing or it really is locking the file. And very often the network file systems are not implemented quite right and there are bugs. And so these things don't do what they're advertised to do, and that can lead to problems. That's the short answer, which is probably all I have time for. But I'll be here if you want to ask me privately. Any last-minute questions in the 10 seconds that remain? No questions. Thank you very much for coming. This work was recorded by VIEW Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, share-alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.